Hey folks, Quilly Dean here. Welcome to Let's Play some Star Sector. Star Sector is a, a lovely indie space sim sandbox RPG exploration trading combat, all those kind of things games. It is uh, still technically in pre-release. I am currently playing on version 0.9. Point one. As far as I know, it's not available on any of the big uh, online stores like Steam or GOG or anything like that. I think you just pick it up directly from um, from the creator's website. I I've I've been meaning to play this game for a while. I've actually had a code for this for a few months, and it's just been it's on, been on my to do list, and I've just haven't gotten around to it until now. And I'm really happy that I did. Um, <clears throat> the games I would say this represents or this is closest to might be something like. It's almost like an EVE Online that's offline and 2D. Um, it's also a lot like the old Escape Velocity game or Escape Velocity Nova people may have played, uh, which was one of my favorite games growing up. So uh, let's pop right in and take a look at Star Sector over here. So we're gonna start a new game. There, there's tutorials to teach you uh, various combat mechanics. Um, there are also missions here, which are sort of uh, one-shot combat encounters, if I understand correctly, and they can be a lot of fun to do. And some people do recommend, hey, maybe just try to go through a few of the easy missions um, to uh, to get warmed up. If you go to a new game, there's also going to be the option of a tutorial that we'll see. So we got to make our character right away, and what I'm going to do, there's a particular... There you go, right over here. We're going to be Salty Petra. Captain Salty Petra is uh yeah she's lovely she's lovely and this is who we're going to be exploring this sector of space with we'll get into some of the lore as much as i picked up once we get in here um so you can pick whether the sector is small or normal sized and what age the sector is we'll go ahead with mixed so the different areas will have uh, different ages and uh we'll get to experience you know just a variety of different uh setups for the star systems and whatnot there is the um right over here there is a shareable seed for the galaxy because the galaxy itself or not the whole galaxy we're just playing in a star sector uh-huh the star sector itself um has a lot of random procedural generated stuff there's one core sector um that is more or less fixed but then a lot of it is going to be randomly generated so you can use this uh the seed to be able to duplicate a galaxy and then we do get a few questions just to start off. We get a little bit of seed money, and then it asks about our recent occupation to get us started. So we can be a bounty hunter commanding a wolf class frigate. Wolf class is a sleek and deadly combat frigate with middling logistics stats. Best used near civilization or with the support of other ships with better, better capacity for fuel or carrying fuel and supplies. Uh, we could start as we were a scavenger commanding a Wayfarer class combat freighter. The Wayfarer is an ungainly vessel with an excellent capacity for carrying cargo, fuel, and crew. Its combat ability is limited, but not to be discounted. Des designed to operate on the fringes of civilization, the freighter is quite capable of defending itself. Then there's three setups for faster start, which is going to start with um, a few extra items and ships and things like that, just to accelerate the early game. I think I'm going to go, we're going to go with the scavenger background. We're, we're not going to go crazy pew pew in this, uh, not necessarily hunt down bounties right away. In fact, um, I think we're going to focus a fair amount on the exploration side of the game early on, because I love that that's something that you can do here. So we'll take a, we were a scavenger with a commanding a Wayfarer class combat freighter. In addition, your fleet includes, so it's going to give us a second ship in our fleet right away. Again. I think there's there's really an emphasis that you are commanding a fleet here because they do start you off right away with the second ship. So either we can have a kite class shuttle. So this thing here is it's small, it doesn't have a ton of firepower, but it's it's fairly nimble and can avoid a lot of damage. It's also going to start us off with um, with a, a ship commander, a captain, an officer to add to this ship. And officers can level up, they can get all sorts of different traits and bonuses and things like that for your vessels. So it's quite nice to start with one. Alternatively, we could start with a shepherd class drone tender with a cargo of heavy machinery. The shepherd here is quite interesting because yeah, it says it's not a combat ship. Um, it does have a um, a hangar for some drones, like they're, they're autonomous fighters basically. So they can provide some amount of backup in combat. But one of the big things is that it's going to have a bunch of mods that help with salvaging and surveying. And so I think we're going to go and commit all the way to the less combat y kind of configuration here. And we're going to have to mostly avoid a lot of fights. And there's going to be. There's going to be a lot of tension and a lot of stealth as we try to uh, dodge some of the more dangerous opponents early on in the game here until we can sort of get ourselves rolling with maybe a more powerful fleet. 
So yes, we'll take the Shepherd class and we'll play on normal difficulty. You can go on easy, so your ships would take less damage, you'd have better sense of range and more salvage. So that is quite a lot easier, but we'll go ahead and normal and probably die pretty quickly. Um, even this, there is a tutorial from the main screen, again, that goes into the nitty gritty of combat. There's also a tutorial here when you start a new game. What this will do is it will start you off in a single star system with um, no ability to leave that star system. It's got a story about rebuilding and restabilizing the jump point so you can leave the star system. Um, and what it does is it will guide you through um, a series of little missions that introduce you to other concepts in the game, um, including salvaging ships and whatnot. And it's quite nice because by the end of the tutorial, you will be set up with um, with a fleet with, with several ships, although they're gonna be in a rough shape, but it's quite cool. We're gonna go and skip it though for this, just so that we can sort of dive into the open worldness. But um, honestly, probably we'd be better off starting with a tutorial and trying to burn through it as quickly as possible just to start with a little bit of extra stuff even if they are pretty beat up ships we'll go ahead and skip it and that's going to be fine so then we have to deploy some skill points some character points uh your initial character starts with three points and then every time you level up you get an extra point i believe the level cap is 50. I think I remember reading that so the way it works is there's tons of these actual skills here um that you would unlock for example if I want to unlock target analysts over here, the first level of this gives me a 50% boost to damaging weapons and engines on other ships. Now this only applies to the ship I'm personally piloting. So some things are the ship I'm personally piloting versus a bonus to the fleet as a whole. So um, I would spend one of my character points unlocking target analysis, but I can't unlock it right now at all unless I go and put a pip into the combat aptitude. So now I've got level one combat aptitude which means I can grab the level one of target analysis, for example. I could also grab the level one of, I don't know, damage control. Um, if I level my aptitude to two, then I can unlock the first level of target analysis. And then if I had another character point, I'd then be able to unlock the second level of this. So um, you can really commit quite a lot in various categories. And I really actually quite like this, this sort of talent system skill system because I think it, it's it, it leads to a lot of thinking uh, because putting a point into the combat aptitude by itself doesn't do anything directly as far as I know so it's a bit of an investment to get to the next level but there are some powerful bonuses so as far as I can tell and I don't have a lot of experience in this game yet the combat bonuses here mostly are about buffing the ship that you personally are piloting and can make your ship much more of a badass in combat leadership over here has a bunch of modifiers that help you run a bigger and better fleet so more command points which is what you use to command your fleet in combat um, as opposed to just letting them try to you know pick their own targets and do the best that they can. So there's a few of those. Um, here's more officers. So each ship in your fleet can have an officer assigned to it. So this would unlock more. So you normally have four, but this can let you go to six, eight, and 10, and so on and so forth. There's also a lot of stuff in here that boosts your fighters on the ship that you personally are piloting. So if you personally are piloting a big carrier, then a bunch of leadership skills will help with that and make your fighters really crazy go nuts in combat. After that, we've got a couple that are a little fuzzier to explain, the technology group over here. Primarily improves the performance of the fleet both in both combat and non-combat areas. So it's got a few different things. Reducing weapon rate recoil, more flux capacity. So flux is, it's sort of like heat, right? If you've played a lot of games where like your weapons and systems generate heat and then you gotta stop shooting to, to let it go down, flux is sort of like that. Um, one of the things that is in this category that a lot of people online seem to consider as very, very potent and very nice is the navigation aptitude here. <clears throat> um, and I think a lot of people do actually prioritize getting rank three of this fairly early from what I can tell. Um, it is quite nice to, I mean, the first two levels are, are pretty decent. The reduced terrain penalty, I may not be the most critical thing, I'm not sure, but it's nice. The reduced fuel consumption is actually brilliant because um, it's a big galaxy, it's a big star sector, and you can burn through a lot of fuel going from point A to point B, so discount is really nice. But I think the level three in particular is kind of amazing. The burn level, burn is the speed basically at which you can traverse the, the sort of campaign map. And so having that go up is kind of nuts. And uh, sustained burn is a really powerful ability that lets you go a lot further as well, uh, so or a lot faster, and that makes it even better. And then transverse jump. Jump into a system through a nascent gravity well or directly into hyperspace. <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure what that means because I've never used it yet, but 
if it does what I think it does, it's very handy to just be able to uh, go through hyperspace, even not necessarily at a jump point, if that's what it means. I don't know. Industry, we've got a bunch of things that um, can still buff combat and things like that. There's also some things in here specifically dealing with, yeah, so colony management, because you can colonize planets in here. So this gives you access to more um, administrators and whatnot. I think a lot of people prioritize, um, uh, people have pointed out that it's really nice to get up to level three salvage, as well as level three recovery options. Uh, between the two of these things, you're gonna get a lot more loot early on. Anyway, I think Salty Petra, I feel like she's got a background in industry and we're gonna go ahead and unlock the first level of recovery operations. So we have an increased chance to recover weapons and fighter LPCs. I don't remember what LPC stands for, but fighters from enemy ships. Um, and we're gonna take the first level of salvage as well, which increases the resources and rare items recovered from bandit stations and other derelicts. And we get the ability to do a remote survey, which sounds pretty cool. So we're gonna we're gonna explore space, we're gonna salvage things, we're gonna try to dodge some of the scariest stuff out there early on. Um, and that's what we're gonna do. So we are generating the world and generating two months worth of just development in the uh of seeding in in our little galaxy here so fleets and markets and things like that are already going to be a little kickstarted when we go and hit space to pause right away and we're going to take a look at the game so this is the i don't remember there's two different modes basically for moving around there's this mode right here where you're piloting your whole fleet and you can basically just click somewhere and your fleet will go to it we just like that, so that's us. Little fleet compared to some of the other guys. Look at this, Ludic Church Faithful Convoy. Massive number of ships in here. Massive number and big ships as well. Whereas we just have our two little baby ships in our fleet. Um, and then in addition to that, there's a combat mode. Combat is, is still real time, but, oh, well, real time and pausable like this, which is really nice, uh, but happens in a, on a different kind of map, a different scale, and a different way to move the ships. I mean, you can actually pilot your ship directly through, like, WASD. It's a lot more action-y, pew-pew, but you can also assign the role to the AI. Like, if you're not someone who wants to play, like, a Twitch video game, this can super 100% be you. If you're someone who's really good at Twitch video games and can pew pew like crazy in space, well, you can also do that and you can build towards either one of those two configurations um, and really optimize for your preference and skill level and, and various things. So here we are, a local view. This is as far as I can sort of zoom out and I can pan around a little bit with the mouse. I can also hit tab here to open the map. So this is the SIP system map. So we're in the Corvus star system, one of the core systems in uh, Star Sector, which is always gonna have the, 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 the plan of Jankala here. Um, and um, I don't know, and a pirate base. I think that's that's pretty consistent. I think some of the things like miscellaneous planets that might be in the system, I think can be randomized, uh, but the core systems are more or less kind of established. So this is the area where we are here. There's our fleet, that little gray triangle, and we're close enough. We've got other fleets that we can see over here. Um, and yeah, we've got a space station here, the Jangala uh, space station. This belongs to the Hegemony faction. So the lore here is that I think the, because we're in this 209th cycle, 206th cycle, sorry. I think that cycle, that's, that's a year. I think that's how many years ago the jump gates, these, there we go. Corvus gate over here, these gateways, I think that's when they collapsed and start, stopped working. We were part of the domain, I think was the massive sort of empire of earth. And uh, these, these gates shut down. And so we've been cut off. I think the lore is for 200 years at this point. There are still ways to get between systems in the current sector because there are jump points which allow you to go into hyperspace and then let you use hyperspace to wander around this sector. But I guess the distances involved from this star sector to other star sectors in the domain were just are just too much. And without the gates, we can't pull it off. But um, yeah, so this is our star sector over here. We can turn on constellation names, which I quite like. So the core worlds, again, as far as I know, this is more or less fixed, but then everything else will change every single game. Um, we've got, uh, right now by default, I have it so that only inhabited systems have their names showing. You can turn that off and you can get the system names everywhere, but we'll toggle that back on. So these are all systems where people live and we could buy and sell goods and whatnot. There are various factions that control these different areas though. We can also toggle on this exploration filter, which I love that it exists. So what this does is it identifies systems that are fully explored. These are the ones with the X's. I mean, those are the ones that are all inhabited. And then it keeps track of all your exploration system in, or exploration 
status in different systems. So over here, alpha Yomi, we, it's got an empty bracket. We haven't visited it at all. And then once we do visit it, then it'll change to a different symbol to say, well, you visited it, but you haven't surveyed all the planets and so on and so forth. Um, I like that it's got that to keep track of it. Really, really wonderful. Anyway, we are going to start off by docking over here at the station. I'll say we'll take a look at what we've got and uh, take a look at our fleet. We'll probably do some, some purchasing right away as well. So we'll just dock here. Excellent. Your fleet approaches Jengala Station. Formed of a vast tiered structure, the first ancient fueling and repair gantries are hidden among corroded industrial hangars that lie in the shadow of a huge ring of laboratories and associated support systems. Higher still, commercial concourses, metroplex districts, and many winged shipyards are all watched over by a command and control spire bristling I do like the word bristling, with communications arrays and weapon pods. Your fleet transmits identification codes via the transponder, and you're soon granted docking clearance. So we did have our transponder on. This is actually a big part of the game, is toggling your transponder on and off. Transponder like broadcasts your identification in a, in a large area, which makes you very visible and clearly identifies your fleet to other fleets out there. When you're in civilized space, they really want you to run with your transponder on, because if you're not, you might be... That's, that's not some sneaky, sneaky bad guy stuff, right? That would do that sort of thing. Um, but if you're not in a safe area, you want to turn it off because you don't want to broadcast your presence to all would-be like pirates and whatnot in the area. So I, I really like that aspect of the game. I think it's quite cool. Um, so here we can open the comm directory. You can see everyone we might be able to talk to. We might have missions to talk to some of these people. There could be a few different things. Some of these um, people could also offer us a commission. So a commission would mean we'd have, like, we would be effectively a part of their military, right? That's that's what that is. We'd be sort of an officer in their military. We'd be aligning with them, this faction. We'd be at war with whoever they're at war with. Um, as I was going to say, I don't think we're able to do it. Clear the checks. Continue. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, I guess with the hegemony, we do start off with enough rep. We could go ahead and get the commission immediately. We're not gonna because we are not here to fight um, at this time. So we're just gonna say no for now. Uh, we can go to the bar. Sometimes there's some people hanging out here that can give you some little missions, although there isn't right now. Uh, there we go. I tabbed out accidentally. And then, yeah, trading and whatnot over here. So, uh, Jangala, which is Jungle World. We can actually get information of the planet. Every, every one of these planets has a bunch of different traits, which can affect how good it works as a colony and whatnot. I like how it's got the population. It's just They're just using 10 to the whatever as a hint about population sizes. So, we got in the millions over here. Uh, various goods. Uh, if you can't find what you want here, this is the open market. There's also the military market. This is only available to people, I believe, who are commissioned. So we really can't interact with some of this. This is why all this is read out. I don't think these are read out because these are things I can buy normally anyway. Uh, and then there's the black market. Black market is great because it avoids tariffs and all kinds of things, but it does raise suspicion level as you you do more and more deals on the black market, and then you're gonna get scammed, you're gonna get harassed, you may even lose some reputation along the way. So we've got that. We did start off with a little bit of cargo. We started off with some heavy machinery. We've got 70 crew members. We've got 80 units of supplies and 70 units of fuel. And this supply is actually a really important thing that we're gonna be consuming a lot as we do things in this game. Um, if we pop over to the Intel screen, this is a screen that we can access on this sort of, you know, world map as we're flying around as well. This keeps track of all the possible missions and bounties and things that we have heard about. As far as I know, you can just find out about these while you're flying around anywhere in the core systems. I don't know if exactly the logic for it. Um, I know, so if we're flying out in uninhabited territory, over here we're not going to find out about new missions as we fly through here we do um as I, presumably i'm assuming it's locked to you know different factions different space you'll get different missions for whatever but basically you'll you'll find out about new tasks as you just fly around the core worlds over here it does nicely uh, divide into stuff. So this is everything that's new, but we can go to local. So these are missions in the Corvus system itself. So there's a system bounty, basically kill anything uh, that the hegemony don't like, and you get some extra money over here in the Corvus system. Um, we also know about a mercantile convoy, which is going from Jangala, which is the, um, the, the space station around the planet where we are in Corvus. So it's leaving from here in Corvus, and it's gonna go to the Ilm, um, I guess base or planet over here in the Zagan star system. So we know that there's a convoy carrying a lot of valuable stuff. And hey, do you want to play pirate? There you go. Um, you got missions over here. Missions are things you actually have to accept. 
to go for, as opposed to bounties where you can just presumably hunt someone down and go and kill their face. We may at some point do some of those. And exploration, well, so it happens right now that the missions we have are both exploration missions, so it's the same in those two. These are fleet departures we know about. Here's that mercantile convoy we already know about, but we also know about a smuggler who's independent. Hmm, independent's not really a faction, right? It may be sort of, kinda? I don't know. And then hostilities. So these are the wars. So if we join the hegemony here, hegemony are currently at war with the, uh, the Persian League and the Tri Tachyon Corporation. So we would be at war with them too. Presumably, I haven't really done the commission stuff yet. Anyway, I really like the idea of these exploration missions. Um, they're pretty valuable. Analyze orbital habitat. Oh, the pirates want me to run a custom sensor package on an orbital habitat. Orbiting a desert world in the Threal system. 70 grand reward. Okay, so we're here. This mission is there. Um, and the other the other exploration mission is down over here. So as you change these categories, it'll show you where they are. So you can sort of plan things. And this is Survey of Barren World, just for independence. Yeah, we will need equipment to do a full survey of brand. This one doesn't need equipment. We might accept both these, because we have 120 days to complete them. I mean, why not, right? All right. Yeah, if we fail to complete it, we're going to piss off the pirates, who already kind of don't like us. Completing this, maybe we make friends with the pirates, which is interesting. So I'm going to accept both these missions, because why not? Um, and yeah, to survey the, the world, we do need mostly a lot of people. So let's take a look, actually, at what our fleet situation is like. So we currently have two vessels in our fleet. Uh, which we need to do some renaming of. Let's actually go to the refit screen over here because then we get to modify something. So we've got currently the ISS Brussels. There we go. Is our Wayfarer class combat freighter piloted by Salty Petra herself and packing a few different weapons. So these are the hard points. I can click on these and replace the weapon in the slot with something else. Um, this shows me everything available. Either I have it in my inventory, like things that are owned, or that I can buy legally, or that I can buy illegally. You can also filter this off. Let's say I don't want to buy anything illegal. Heck, I don't want to buy anything at all. Oh, I have nothing actually owned over here. So we can pop that in. What do we have on this right now? It is a light dual auto cannon range of 600 does 143 damage per second now that is a very fuzzy number because it's modified by so many things um with with defensive traits that your opponent might have um this is using uh kinetic um art like it's a kinetic thing it's a bullet that which is apparently very good against shields but very poor against armor uh it also has very poor accuracy um so you know, may or may not work too well. Uh, what do we also have here? A light assault gun. So it also has a range of 600. And you can see the arc as well as I mouse over here. So the arc that would be covered by these guns. Um, does it... Oh, it fires much faster. Yeah, the light assault gun fires very fast. You can see the refire rate delay at the bottom. 0.25 versus 0.7. This does fire in a rate. Oh, right. Dual autocannon. So it fires two bullets per. Yeah, so that's why it's 50 times two damage. Uh, whereas this is a single slug of 40 damage. It's high explosive, so it's really good against armor, but worse against shields. Okay. I mean, so you kind of have a couple of different things um, covered over there. And yeah, so you can just click and see everything that's available to that you can put in that slot um, based on things that you own here versus things you can buy as well. There's also this auto fit system, um, which normally these ships will have multiple different variants. And this will try to fit systems in a certain way. Um, and it'll even, it'll purchase everything for you, which is kind of nice. Uh, so we've got the Brussels. We're also going to have the ISS Sprout, which is our Shepard class drone tender here. So, you know, you know, a few weapons. I like how this ship only has weapons on the right side. It's pure, like sort of broadside kind of setup. It has no hard points on the left side. Kind of nifty. I like it. Um, you can actually you run simulations as well, so you can like simulate fights to see how well you can do with your different loadouts. We're going to leave things be as is for now. That's going to be a-okay. Um, but we have currently, we have 70 crew. We need 40 to run all of our ships. We have 70. More is fine. It gives you some spares for things. But we know we need a lot of crew to finish those survey things. So we are actually going to get some extra ships. We also want an extra ship because we don't have enough fuel to necessarily go super far. Our current fleet can carry up to 80 units of fuel. And that won't 
potentially carry us the distance that we need to explore the stuff that's way out in the middle of nowhere. So we're gonna buy some ships. We're gonna go back to the fleet tab. We're gonna go to the buy tab over here. We're gonna buy some vessels. We have 32,000 credits here, which isn't a ton, but will help us get started. What we need is we need a tanker. So the deal with the tanker is that it has massive fuel capacity. This Dram class tanker can hold up to 300 units of fuel as opposed to our 80 over here. Now, of course, it itself will burn some fuel as it's putting around in our fleet, but mostly it's gonna be, it's gonna move us ahead. That'll take 13 grand to buy, but we are gonna buy one. We've got two tankers. They should be basically identical. If you see any ships with these little pips in the top right corner. It took me a long time to figure out what they are. This is how many damage subsystems are on this ship. So this Condor over here, D for damage, um, has three pips of damage things. We actually get information about it over here. Extensive damage can't be repaired without a costly restoration. We can see down here it has malfunctioning comms, compromised hull, and an unreliable subsystems. And these will all be pretty substantial debuffs to our ship as we do things. I don't know specifically what these do. When If we were to buy the ship, we'd be able to get in specific information as to what these are. But this is clearly worse than normal. I think over here, there's a go, compromised hull. See, its hull integrity is normally 3,500, but I think it's lost 1,500 from that because of the compromised hull. So this is this would be a lot squishier than your normal Condor, but presumably is cheaper, so I don't know. We might want to consider that. Anyway, um, the Dram here have no, no negative traits, so we'll buy one tanker. And we are also going to pick up this mud skipper, which is really cheap, 5,300 credits. But what this is, is this is a transport, so it can fit 100 crew on it. Um, so it can carry a lot more people. So right now, our cap, well, our cap of crew was 80. Now it's 90 because we did buy a ship with some, car, with some capacity. But yeah, we're going to pick up a transport ship. There we go. So we can fit a lot more crew because I think we needed about 150. So now our cap, cap is 190. So we should be able to do all the surveying jobs out there all right so we are going to let me pop out of here we're going to do repair because some of the ships were a little bit uh, busted so repairing will cost us supplies we have 80 it's going to cost us four repairing ships can be done automatically in space it just takes time and still eats your supplies but we'll repair over here because it does it right away i don't know if it's cheaper it might use fewer supplies to repair in dock like this i'm not certain but it certainly is a lot faster so now that we've done that let's go and cap ourselves off here we need more crew. So if we just control click on the stack, it will fill up our crew. So bring us to 190, which would be our limit here. Note, because we're going through the official market, we have to pay tariffs, 30% tariff here. Now, I don't know if this rate changes as you develop a better reputation with these factions, or maybe um, you get a commission with them, because a 30% tariff rate is nuts. We're gonna say no to that. Instead, we're gonna go to the black market. So suspicion levels are currently low. We're going to be fine. I'm going to buy my crew here, hire my crew from the black market without paying tariffs. Excellent. We're also going to go ahead and control click our fuel, um, which we can't afford a full stack of fuel. So let's bring that down some. We do want a lot of fuel. Um, I would like some more supplies. There we go. Well, hopefully that's going to be enough. We will confirm that. We are broke. We have 95 credits left to our name. But theoretically, we have a fleet kitted out to go and do some early exploration for the missions we've just taken. Let's go back to the Intel screen. So yeah, under the important tab, these are missions I have agreed to do. And so what I'm going to do is I'll set a, a course for the, um, the barren world over here first. Yeah, I think that's going to be okay. So, oh, we can... Oh, we can't see any further. Normally, when you show on map, you'd actually see the actual planet we specifically have to go to. But the system's unexplored, so we can't look at it. Uh, we can't go to the system map. But I can lay in a course. So we're going to be heading over to the Valifar system from Corvus over here. I think I like that. So we're going to leave. So I can still, you know, I can pilot my ship. But you see, like, the, uh, the lines here? Oh, I think we're going to get scanned. Yep, allow the scan. Yeah, we have no contraband. Uh, because we've been suspicious, right? Our fleet matches the profile of suspected smuggler, right? Because we've been interacting with the black market. So now we're going to get scanned from time to time. But we're fine. So yeah, the arrow is your course. And over here, you can actually see the course that you've got going on. We can go and resume course. So the distance we're going to travel, how many days it's going to take, 
It's, a, it's got the two bits here because the first number is the in-system distance that we're going to be flying, and then we're going to be doing some hyperspace stuff after that. We can accelerate ourselves. We can activate our sustain burn ability here. Oh, well, we're going to go and hit the jump point first, so we'll do that. So activating the jump point itself uses fuel, and then we're going to use a lot of fuel as we traverse hyperspace. But that's okay. We'll take a jump to hyperspace, and boom, here we are. I love the fact that we're actually going to be piloting hyperspace itself. It's its own landscape. Who the hell are you? You're pursuing my fleet. You're small. But we we really are not packed for combat. We might be fine taking this. But I think I'd rather just avoid it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate my emergency burn. Emergency burn takes consumes fuel and supplies directly. It's it's pretty rough, but it does give us a boost to our speed. We're going to do that. We're also going to go ahead and disable our transponder. Now that we're in hyperspace here, we're going to turn that off so that people won't be able to see us from infinitely far away. All right, we'll unpause. Oh, interdiction pulse. What this does when it fires... Oh, there it is. We just got out of range. And see, we're still hearing about missions here in hyperspace. Interdiction pulse cancels your engine modes. So your emergency burn and your sustain burn both would get canceled. All right. Um, this... These clouds can be pretty bad because they can have storms going on. Oh, he was still trying to find us. Look at that. But you can store to see his sensor range. Um, get the little pings of rings of things. Ooh. Hopefully you're okay. Pursuing pirate scout. Yeah. We're going to take damage in these storms. Whew. Made it through without taking damage. Excellent. All right. We are going to activate sustain burn. So sustain burn... Your acceleration is really bad, and your turning rate is really bad as well. But your maximum burn speed... Man, there's a lot of pirates out there. Emergency burn away. Excellent. We should talk actually about how the sensors work for a second. So, Because uh, I really like this system as well. So detection range over here, this is how big of a sensor blip we are. Um, that basically the distance, sort of the distance people can, can um, spot us. So a bunch of things will make this detection range go up or down. So our emergency burn actually does increase this detection range by 50%. We're easier to spot because we're run, running our engines hot. If we sustain burn is actually plus 100%, so even more. When we have our transponder on, it's a flat plus 1000, which is pretty substantial. We can also go dark, which is sort of the inverse of this. It reduces the range at which our fleet can be detected by 50%, but reduces our burn level. So we go a lot slower, but we're a lot harder to detect. Then we've got our actual sensor range over here. So in fact, I've got to sneeze. <laughs> There you go. Everyone take a drink or cross that off your bingo card. Whew. Um, it, it, I believe the way that detection actually works is your sensor range plus the detection range of the other thing added together is sort of the distance that you can see each other. All right, we'll resume course over here. We'll go ahead and engage sustained burn again. Sustained burn, so your burn rate, which is this thing over here, gets doubled. So you go twice as fast. The maneuverability is really poor really poor. It can be hard to skirt some of these storms. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm sort of alternating. Oh, no! See? Turning radius poor. We just took some damage. Um, yeah. Which is stinky because we're going to be burning through more supplies repairing our ships. We lose some combat readiness as well. Uh, I can't remember what I was going to say, but yeah, the sustained burn, you, go, you have double the burn, so you go twice as fast. So it takes you fewer days to get places, but you lose a lot of maneuverability. And yeah, so I still have the, the, um, the course log logged in, so I can always keep hitting this resume course button for it to autopilot me. And then basically, I'm just gonna manually try to steer through the worst of these clouds. Avoid the bright spots, because those are the places that are stormy. Oh, this is a lot of cloud I do not like. Do not like. Nope. Ow, 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 yes. We've taken a lot of damage. Is this the system? Yeah, they are. Okay. So you can uh, drop out of hyperspace at a jump point like this one, or any substantial um, gravity well. Like, you can jump at the star itself. Although, what happens then is uh, you can be too close to the star and then start taking some damage, or, well, maybe not damage, but... Um, 
you lose combat readiness, which is something we'll talk about at some point. So, let's take a look at the star system here. So I have to survey one of these planets. Oh, this one over here. We got a quest for it and everything. So, radiation from nearby star ravages the surface of this world due to lack of an atmospheric ozone layer. No significant geological activity, no indigenous life forms. Preliminary examination from low orbit is required to determine biohazard rating, baseline surface conditions, and full survey requirements. So we can lay in a course to that. Um, these stable locations are places where you can drop um, your own buoys. So actually, I could I could do that. I could show you specifically. If I go to the stable location here, there you go. I can construct calm sensor or nav buoys over here, which give you different bonuses. And this ties in pretty heavily, I think, to the idea that you can colonize systems. So I'm running dark right now, which is lowering my burn speed. But we are a very tiny sensor echo. It's it's uninhabited, so it's probably a safe system. But we may as well be a little bit cautious. You can hold shift, by the way, to speed up the time. So even if you're going slow like this, you can accelerate just a little. This is going to take us more time to get there, of course, because we're slow. But we've got, we should be good on supplies and everything. So we have to survey the planet of Brand. And we are contracted to do it. But we could survey this even if we didn't have a contract. So there we go. Um, hazard rating. So we need 30 heavy machinery, and we have 35. We need 150 crew, and we have 190. We also need 35 supplies. We have 71, but that is pretty, pretty intense. Uh, planet has no atmosphere, so yes, plus 50% hazard rating. Let's perform a survey here. Rich ore deposits. Uh, we gain some experience points and class one survey data. So whenever you scan, whenever you survey a planet, you will get survey data. Um, and this will have more or less value. I think it goes from 1 to 5. The class 1 survey data is not worth very much, but it's still something. And yeah, we know there's rich ore deposits, so this would be a quite good mining colony if we decided to go that way. No atmosphere, so, you know, a little more intense to set up, but might still have some value. And we could establish a colony. If we had 1,000 crew and 100 machinery and 200 supply, we could do it. Now, we get our machinery and our crew back unless something goes badly, but we don't get our supplies. So we actually are quite low on supplies now. Uh, we're not going to establish colony. Nope. Thank you. We're just going to leave. So supplies. We are consuming supplies at a rate of 0.4 supply per day for ship maintenance. If our ships take damage, if other things happen, the supply usage will go up dramatically. I don't like only have 36 supply here. Um, I'm trying to decide if I'm still going to go and do this other mission. I think we are. It's a little risky. We could definitely run very low on supplies, but I think it's going to be worthwhile. 13 days at base burn level. Then we still have to make it back. I guess I still have 99 days to complete the mission, but I really didn't want to fly back home first. Well, I mean, that's not that far. What I should have done, well, I guess it comes out the same. I was going to say, I should have done this first and then come here. But it, then it would have surprised me that it used up so many supplies. You know, we'll just go straight to 3L. Which could possibly go wrong? Urgh, it's a little dicey. We did get the money right away. So we got 60,000 credits now in our bank, plus the 95 we had before. Yeah, we're going to try to make it to the other site. Um, we may have to go a little faster to cut back on time for our supplies. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a cut in here, folks. Uh, I know there's no combat this episode, but hopefully you find the game kind of interesting and intriguing. I'm I'm kind of liking it. One of the things I have to say is I wish it had a little bit more of a campaign story. Not, not, not a full one, but again, I think about back to my days of playing Escape Velocity. And it was very similar to something like this. But each of the factions had a quest chain. Um, of, you know, X number of missions that you could do. It would be a good way to get introduced to the faction, to develop a lot of reputation with them and relationship with them. As far as I know, other than tutorial, I think all the missions and things are just procedurally generated on the fly, which is great for openness and replayability. But I think I would like a little bit of a story element. I don't think there is one. But so far, that's the only semi-negative I could sort of present to things. We need to get a relationship boost with the... With the independence. Are they actually a faction? They are actually a faction. I'm assuming I can't be commissioned by them. But I guess they still have some people they don't like. Ludic Path and Pie. I don't know. Maybe there's something. Things that are illegal with the independence. Recreational drugs and harvested organs. 
Hegemony, sim things, but also heavy armaments and AR cores are uh, illegal. So those are things that were, if we had them in our cap, uh, cargo hold when we got scanned, um, we would get into some trouble. But yeah, we'll uh, we'll continue this next time. Hey, folks, thanks for watching. If you are new to the channel, uh, do make sure to subscribe and you can hit the little bell to make sure that you get uh, true notifications when a new video goes up. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.